My name is Tracy Grimm. I'm the flight archivist for the Purdue University Archives. And this is an oral history interview today with Dr. Robert Strickler. Um, the date is October 7th, 2015. Thank you very much, Dr. Strickler, for coming and for uh, participating in our oral history program. You're welcome. Um, I want to start out asking you some questions about your formative years, so before you came to Purdue. Can you just tell us um, where you were born, uh, where do you grew up, and what it was like? Okay, uh, I was born in Springfield, Illinois. Uh, grew up in Watsika, Illinois, which is about 60 miles northwest of Lafayette. Uh, I grew up in what I would call a Norman Rockwell childhood. Uh, in fact, I have a Norman Rockwell cub tie on today <laughs> because the cubs are finally playing for real again. Um, was a high school I went to was about 350 kids. Um, the uh, we had a, a excellent. We happened to have an excellent high school system in uh, in Watsika. And uh, I'm very confident that our kids could compete with the best schools in Illinois. In fact, uh, <clears throat> we uh, frequently found ourselves competitively ranked with New, New Trier, which was the Biggie Deal High School at the time in Illinois. <clears throat> it was up in Winnetka. And uh, the uh, kids from our high school scored on scholarship tests and missions tests. Uh, at, as high as anyone in the state. Um, I was motivated uh, to get into engineering not because I knew what engineering was, but because I was encouraged by uh, high school teachers uh, to uh, look into it. I was had excellent grades in science and math, and I liked model airplanes. Mm -hmm. And so the history back when I grew up was that kids who liked model airplanes thought, gee, they could be aeronautical engineers, kids who fooled around with cars uh, became mechanical engineers, kids who fooled around with stereo systems became electrical engineers. So that was, that was that's the way it was in this Norman Rockwell era mm -hmm. growing up in the 50s. Uh, I came to Purdue, as I told you earlier, because it was smaller than the University of Illinois. And I was fortunate to have a scholarship here which uh, eliminated the uh, out-of-state tuition uh, barrier. And uh, my parents made it quite clear that uh, uh, going, going out of, out of state, or going to school period would require scholarships. So I was on a path to be uh, in the Navy ROTC. At that time, the Navy ROTC was, the, uh, was a way to get what might be called a full ride scholarship. Uh, and usually they would have 40, 40 students at, uh, at each university where they had Navy ROTC uh, ins installations. I uh, was late in passing my physical, and so Purdue was filled up. And uh, there were only two schools I could get into, one being Notre Dame and one being Georgia Tech, and I had no interest in either one of them. <laughs> and so, uh, uh, I was able to get into Purdue just with a regular scholarship, uh, uh, and uh, which which I really appreciated. Uh, the uh, size of the school was important because it was, uh, at that time I entered it's about ten thousand students, uh, which uh, was a, for someone that was graduating from a high school with three hundred and fifty was huge, but uh, much smaller than the University of Illinois, which was at that time 18 to 20,000. So that was, the, that was one of the appeals. Uh, there was not much information available about ranking of schools, although anecdotally Purdue was viewed to be good in engineering, and by sizing up aeronautical buildings and installations at both U of I and Purdue, it was clear to me that Purdue was more into aeronautical engineering than Illinois was. And so it was a no-brainer for me to, uh, to come here. And I'm, I'm very happy that I did. Uh, the uh, education we had was uh, 
very competitive here at Purdue at that time. Uh, it, was a, it was a world where you knew that uh, uh, you were going to be tested and it was a, a survival of the fittest because it, the, uh, the goal was uh, for the, the university to wean out uh, people who really didn't belong. And that's, and that's the way that uh, it was during the freshman year in, uh, in engineering. Uh, the math and the physics and the chemistry courses took their tolls mm. and maybe a third or a half of the students didn't, didn't make it to the sophomore year. Uh, and that's just the way it was. Yeah. Uh, I was fortunate I was placed in the advanced courses. We had a new curriculum in, uh, when I entered in 1956 and I was mentioning this book that you have, uh, it was written by uh, Larry Carnino and uh, others is good because it, uh, for a lot of reasons, but one of the things that interests me is it has a, the curricula changes through the years. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I entered in 56, it was the first year of the so-called theoretical curriculum. Up until that time, students in engineering spent a summer here welding, uh, doing land surveys, doing machine shop work, and that sort of thing. Really. Uh, dirt under the fingernails type of work. And uh, they moved away from that and we went to all classroom science and math in, in, in engineering, uh, which was uh, quite, a, quite a dramatic change. And it was uh, very rigorous and, uh, and, and tough. Um, the experience uh, in getting good grades uh, was hard to come by because good grades were hard to come by as uh, as an undergrad student because we were, we were taking 18 to 20, 21 credits a semester. That's a lot. Very, very busy. Uh, I was in the fraternity, I was president of the fraternity, and I had all kinds of other things to do. Oh. And uh, Which fraternity? Triangle fraternity. It's uh, 103 University. Uh, it's well located in uh, we always had the highest grade average at that time on campus. Uh, we prided ourselves on our, we were engineers, and we prided ourselves on our ability to uh, participate <laughs> academically. Mm -hmm. um, I want to ask you about your experience being an engineering mm -hmm. student, but before I do that, I want to go back and ask something that I, um, about how you chose aeronautical engineering. Were there things that influenced you, like science fiction, or the things that were happening with the Yeah, I you think, know, the, uh, the you know, space? comic books at the time, uh, the Buck Rogers, Flash Gordon yeah. type comic books, and uh, well, they called them comic books, uh, uh, that sort of thing, uh, uh, radio adventures, uh, uh, going into space and that sort of thing. Yeah, that's part of it. And plus, there was, we just come out of World War II, and I was interested in the in the planes of World War II, Lockheed P thirty eights, and uh, Boeing Stratofortresses, and all that sort of stuff. I mean, that's the world we grew up in. I mean, right. everybody had favorite right. airplanes and uh, related to them, and we built model airplanes. We built model airplanes and flew them, and so that's the that was. You know, that's the world we lived in as, yeah. as kids growing up. Yeah. So it was, it was not, not that I knew what aeronautical engineering was. Right. In fact, I never really knew what it was until I had a summer job between my junior and senior year here. And I worked for North American over in Columbus, Ohio. And uh, I was ushered into this room as a summer hire. Uh, and it was just a sea of drafting tables. I mean, just as far as the eye could see, you know, guys who were old, you know, 50 years old, which to me was old, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, sit, had been sitting there since they were 20 or 21, graduating from college, sitting at the draft of the table. And I actually couldn't bear that. And I thought, if this is what aeronautical engineering is, I have made a big mistake in my life. Really? And so my goal from then on was to get out of it. And I figured the only way I could get out of it was to go uh, go for a graduate degree. So I, I became interested then in going for a, a master's degree, and I thought I could get away from the drafting table. And uh, so I 
came back from that summer job with the goal of uh, readying myself to uh, get a graduate degree. Did you envision what that would mean? Like not being at the drafting table, where would you be? Or I, what was I, your I had a, a vision that uh, rather than being asked to uh, work on a piece part of a landing gear, which is what I did uh, over that summer, mm -hmm. although I realized that was a summer job, so they're not going to going to give you anything that's <laughs> important to do. <laughs> but it was decidedly unimportant. And, uh, and, and I thought, gee, what I would like to do in, the air, in, in this world is be at the front end, you know, with, with the concept. Right. What is it that we need and what does this thing need to look like rather than doing the nit and natty design of a piece part on something that uh, I had no idea where it came from. And so I thought if I got a master's degree, essentially I could get above the nitty gritty of detailed design to the point of being in a position to define what the concept was. Right. And so that was my motivation, not knowing whether that's true or not, but that, that's my own, my own thought process. Right. At breakfast, you were, we were talking about, and you mentioned how the curriculum was very theoretical. Yes. And then how when you came back, you got to the lab. Could you talk a little bit about yeah, that? Yeah, uh, I had an opportunity then to, uh, <coughs> when I was working at Aerojet in uh, Sacramento, an opportunity to uh, meet uh, some university professors from Purdue, Zucro and Osborne, Bob Osborne and Marty Zucro. And uh, they uh, asked me to come back to uh, work with them at, uh, at the rocket lab. So this was when you, after you had your master's? Yes. And your first job? Yeah, there? first job. And uh, I already had my master's from uh, a school of aeronautical and in engineering science here. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so let me, maybe I ought to get to the progression so mm -hmm. I'm not jumping into the rocket lab too soon. After the North American experience, which was between my junior and senior year, I, want, I elected to go to graduate school. Uh, I must admit that I did not search for other graduate schools to attend. It never occurred to me that uh, the thing to do was to maybe leave Purdue and go somewhere else. It just seemed natural to be here. And, uh, and coincidentally, at the time I graduated in June of 60, the Aero School moved in from the airport to campus and merged with the School of Engineering Science, which was really a theoretical school and became the School of Aeronautical and Engineering Science. And uh, I thought, gee, that's, that's where I want to be. And, uh, and it was, uh, so that's where I decided, to, to, the only place I applied to go to graduate school was here uh, as a master's student. And I was admitted and worked for Paul Stanley, who was the head of the school, and I was, he was my major professor. And, uh, and I enjoyed that experience and uh, it worked well. He encouraged me to stay for a PhD and he wanted me to go into, uh, at that time, something called biomedical engineering, which had, no one knew what that was, including me or, or him, I think. But the notion was it was to go to Indianapolis Methodist Hospital and work on fluid dynamics of the uh, uh, bloodstream. And it, it, it sounded exciting to me, but I was, uh, at that time, I, uh, I was married and uh, you know, had a child on the way, and it was just too much to bear, huh? <laughs> to, to consider to, uh, to do that. So I went to work for Aerojet in Sacramento. And uh, then uh, after working there for about a year and a half or so, was when I uh, had this opportunity to meet uh, Zucro and Osborne, who encouraged me to come back to the rocket lab. And I knew nothing really about the rocket lab or Zucro and Osborne, to tell you the truth. Um, but I found them to be, you know, good people, and they were certainly on top of their game. And uh, and so I had the opportunity to come back uh, to Purdue to work with them, and they wanted my assignment was to help develop this what was called a high pressure combustion research lab. Uh, Zucro had been able to get uh, four million dollars from NASA uh, to, to build this uh, laboratory 
And what he wanted to do was build a laboratory which was bigger <laughs> than the Air Force rocket lab at Edwards Air Force Base. And he knew that the Air Force rocket lab at Ed Ed Edwards Air Force Base was not going to work on high chamber pressure engines. And he wanted to have the singular uh, facility in the United States to do that. And so that's what the assignment was. Not that I was good at designing laboratory. In fact, I knew nothing about it, to be honest with you. But uh, uh, that was my job. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and it worked. And, uh, and so it, it got me in a different, different path, and, uh, which changed, it was career changing because I was away from the, uh, doing the analysis, structural analysis or fluid mechanics analysis, uh, theoretical work. And this was design work and uh, instrumentation work and that sort of thing. And it was, uh, was eye-opening for me. So you were a PhD student at the time. Yeah. But you were also working. Yes. Designing the, yeah. the lab. Yeah. Um, we, we, was Professor Ayersman there then? He came about a year later. A year later. Yeah. He came from Aerojet in, uh, yeah, in was, Azusa. There's a lot of Aerojet connections here. Yeah, and here. the uh, Aerojet in Azusa test facility was being closed down because of air pollution problems in uh, Southern California. I mean, they could no longer do this, and so he was, he, he came to Purdue at that time. That was, must have been 65 or so. So you were a student at the lab as well as sort yeah, of well, was a, I was, you I was a research, 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 we were all research assistants. Were you doing lab. your own research as well? Other yeah. Than, or was it designing the, the well, laboratory? Well, at first, part of most of it was really design the lab. And, mm -hmm. uh, and, and it turned out it was getting, and then getting this initial uh, experiment operational. That's mm -hmm. what I did. Mm -hmm. uh, um. Did the laboratory have a community or an identity apart from the main campus that you? Oh kind of yes, remembered? the laboratory uh, uh, was uh, during my years here as a undergrad and even as a master's student. I knew no, I didn't even know about the rocket lab. Uh, the rocket lab was formed by by Zucro. <coughs> uh, he split off from Aero Engineering in uh, 1945. This is before my time, obviously. And uh, I don't know the history of that, but anyway, he did his own thing and set up this shop on the west side of uh, what was the Aero School uh, at the airport, uh, about a mile west of uh, the airport, and uh, set up this rocket lab uh, to do fundamentally uh, solid propulsion work. He, uh, his career started uh, in uh, California, with uh, Theodore von Karman. Uh, Zucro was the chief engineer and von Karman was the senior science of uh, Aerojet, which was a company formed to build uh, JADO units, jet assisted takeoff units, uh, strap on uh, uh, aircraft so they could get off the aircraft carriers or short runways uh, around the world. And so that's how Aerojet got its start and that's how Zucro really got his start in the, in the propulsion business. Mm -hmm. And uh, so at that time there was a lot of fundamental work going on in solid propulsion, uh, uh, combustion instability, which is a big problem, uh, oscillations of the burning patterns in, uh, in, uh, in a solid rocket motor. And so there was quite a bit of effort on that, quite a bit of effort on the cooling liquid rocket engines uh, developing film cooling techniques where fuel or oxidizer could come down the walls of the uh, of the uh, nozzles and uh, cool them uh, so they could use uh, higher temperatures or, or higher thrust engines, higher pressure engines, or uh, go for long durations. And so there was a lot of good work and there was a tight knit community and well regarded. People who were in it uh, were very well regarded. Mm -hmm. If you, uh, once you were in it and uh, were a Zucro person, you were anointed in the, in the world of propulsion. And it was, it was a big deal. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about that? Like your memories of Dr. Zucro and, and how 
well, how you experienced that I, anointment. I, I think one of the one of the things that amazed me was uh, he and I went to NASA Lewis. NASA Lewis was funding this project, and rather than just simply go, he commissioned the uh, DC three. Purdue had a fleet of DC threes at that time. We flew from uh, our airport over to NASA Lewis, and he he had the pilot pull right up to the right up to the front door of the NASA administration building there on the, which is at the Hopkins Airport, Cleveland Hopkins Airport, it's on the northwest corner, and the airplane just pulled right up and just blew their minds. And Zupero and I got out and showed them our plans for the for the rocket lab here, the high pressure lab. And uh, it, was a, it was just amazing to me. He was a, it was obvious that he had the, you know, he could, I think, could have told them almost anything. Uh, and he was that well respected that they would have believed him. Not, not that he told them falsehoods. I don't mean to imply that at all. But that's how well respected he was. He was, he was uh, at the peak of the, uh, of the, of the uh, puzzle in, the, in, that, in that world. Mm -hmm. What was it like to work with him? He, uh, well, you worked for him. You didn't work with him. Ah. So that's, uh, yeah, <laughs> and I think that that's, that's good because he, he uh, you know, he would tell you what he expected and it was up to you to, to do it. You didn't work with him. You worked for him and produced results or, or not. And so that's, that's the way it was. And that's, that's a good, good background. Mm -hmm. One of the things that he did uh, <coughs> which uh, helped helped me and helped the others who worked under him out there, was that he would have research reviews at least once a year and sometimes twice a year with sponsors. Where the sponsors who were funding the research would come in and we would give, these, this was before PowerPoint obviously, so we would give detailed presentations on what we were doing. And this was, this was important because uh, most students never have that experience. They never have the experience of sell, not selling, but uh, summarizing what they're doing and getting critical opinions, you know, bounce back. In other words, somebody can, was perfectly legal for someone to say that's wrong or you're do, you need to do it this way or whatever. Mm -hmm. And so there, th that opportunity for interchange was extremely important and uh, valuable in, yeah. in a career shaping a career. And so when you graduated, you really had something. You really knew how to, uh, how to, how to compete in the business world. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, what memories do you have of the Purdue Airport itself? <laughs> well, the, uh, okay, the, 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 the several questions that are there. One, one is the, uh, I assume you don't mean the commercial airport, but if you do, I have uh, an interesting, yeah. A side story yeah, about that is that the airline that operated out there was called Lake Central, L-A-K-E Central. We used to call it Late L-A-T-E Central. <laughs> they flew DC-3s between here and Chicago and I don't know where else they went, but it was the way that you, uh, or if you wanted to leave, or leave campus, you that's how you did it. I was going to, I think, Seattle. Uh, doesn't make any difference where I was going, but I was going on an interview trip somewhere, and I got this call from Lake Central. It said, "Gee, we have we have an icing problem this morning. I wonder if you could uh, reduce the, your baggage <laughs> by thirty pounds." <laughs> and by three pounds. So thirty pounds. Thirty and pounds. And I thought, "Holy cow!" <laughs> You know, how many people are on this airplane, et cetera, et cetera. But anyway, uh, that was a real call, and that's, that's, that's the world we lived in. It was like it being in the 1920s or something. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> this was in, in uh, the early 60s, it must have been 61 or 62. And uh, so, but back to the airport itself, we had, uh, we had classes out there. The Aero School was located there. And uh, Harold de Groff was the uh, was the uh, leader of the school. We had a, a stable of uh, instructors who or professors who were very well known. Elmer Broon was uh, uh, was the key guy in uh, structures, and he was well known in the airplane world. 
in terms of uh, uh, doing structural analysis, balancing loads, and uh, and so everybody took uh, uh, courses from Elmer Broom. Uh, and uh, uh, Purdue pr pr produced a lot of structural engineers that were involved in aircraft design as a result of that. We also had uh, uh, a Paul Lycoutis, who was very good at fluid mechanics, theoretical fluid mechanics. He uh, eventually uh, went over and headed the nuclear engineering school, and I'm not sure what's, where he's been since then, but he, he was is a very good fluid mechanics leader. We had uh, uh, um, excuse me, uh, Gustafson. Uh, Gus Gustafson came in and uh, also took uh, taught fluid mechanics, and he was a real teacher. He was very interested in making sure that the students understood what was what was being said. And, uh, and uh, of the teachers I've had at Purdue, instructors I've had at Purdue, he was probably the best, if I recall, teacher uh, because, of, because of the way he was interested in, in, the, in what the students were learning. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's important because oftentimes, or sometimes that's not the case. Um, the, uh, it was, we at, the, at those times we were responsible for getting out to the airport and getting back on our own. There was no bus service. We uh, had cars or carpooled or whatever. There was parking on campus. Uh, the streets that are paved over here now, uh, which are essentially sidewalks, were at that time really streets and you just parked wherever on the streets. And, uh, and so we had 10 minutes to get back from the class at the airport to here and park oh and get goodness. in the class. It must have been uh, stressful. So, uh, it was stressful and often late for class, particularly if it was rain or snowing or something. It was an adventure. But it was a tight-knit group. The Aero School was a tight-knit group because of that. We all fought the same battles. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. We had the same transportation problems. We had the, took the same courses. We were all in the same math and chemistry and physics and mm -hmm. uh, double E courses and ME courses. Uh, the electives were the same, and uh, so it was a tight knit group. We had, I think, when I graduated, there were about seventy six of us or so. Well, one of the questions I had was, what 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 was it like to meet with Purdue alumni along your career path? Oh, that likes questions. Uh, it's always exciting to meet a uh, to meet a Boiler Maker because you go, <coughs> you go, you ask the same part, the sort of questions of that that you're asking of me. Why did you come to Purdue? What have you done since, and on and on. Yeah. And so it's a, it's a tight knit group, uh, particularly for those in engineering, but even those who are not in engineering, whether it's business, uh, Cranard School, or pharmacy, right. or uh, vet school, or whatever. Uh, <coughs> it's uh, you know there are these ties that you have because of spending time here. I spent ten years on campus, so that's a fair amount of one's life uh, yeah. to spend. Them. That's a major, major commitment. Mm -hmm. And so I met a lot of people along the way who were here at the same time, a lot who were here after I left. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, uh, it's always fascinating. Mm -hmm. um, if we could transition to your career, um, could you talk about your first job after your PhD here at Purdue and what it was like being a young engineer during the height of the space race? And well, it's, uh, <laughs> yeah, it was, uh, it turns out that, that was really dramatic for me because uh, I was hired to, uh, I, I had worked at Aerojet, uh, one of my jobs at Aerojet was working on the lunar excursion module, engine design, and, uh, and so uh, that was in the summer of 62 uh, at Aerojet worked on that, and uh, I worked for a guy named Alex Marashev, who invented a way to throttle uh, liquid engines. Because this, li uh, this lunar excursion module, as it came down, had to be able to throttle the thrust from uh, down to 10% value of what of peak value. Uh, so, it, so it wouldn't, when it hit the ground, it would 
softening it. You don't want to try to lay them down full thrust. And, but on the other hand, you want to have full thrust so you could take off. Uh, and so you, the development of this engine was, was critical. And anyway, long story short, he offered me a job when I, when I finished my PhD to come out and work for him at Aerospace Corporation because Aerospace was going to have a contract to help the Air Force develop the next big missile. And it was called WS-120A. 120 meaning the diameter in inches, 10 feet in diameter. And uh, so that's what I, I accepted the job. I had other job offers uh, in fun finishing my PhD. I had maybe a dozen offers. Uh, those were really <laughs> hard. The country was really intent on winning the space race at that time and all that. So there were all, all kinds of opportunities for someone with uh, my background. But that's the job I took. Well, <coughs> my wife and two kids uh, moved to California because I, a, a friend of mine at the Rocket Lab had graduated six months earlier than I had. And he lived in a house in Redlands. And he wanted to buy the house next door. But he had this, uh, he had this uh, couldn't get out of the lease of the house he was in. Uh, so he wanted. To, he called uh, me and said, "Do you and Ann, my wife, want to rent our house?" Uh, and I said, "Well, you know, I'm not really ready to get out there yet." Uh, he said, "Well, why, why, why can't she come out?" And so it was winter here. Uh, it was, and, and and so she said, "Heck yes!" So <laughs> she and the two kids uh, moved to uh, California to Redlands. And I was uh, over in, uh, we had a home here in what's called Tecumseh, the southeast side of Lafayette. And, uh, <clears throat> and so we moved the stuff out, and I was sitting there on top of Mayflower boxes. And I got this call from Aerospace that said, uh, gee, Bob, I hate to tell you this, but this program that you were going to work on uh, doesn't exist. The Air Force has decided to make this thing a solid booster, uh, and it, uh, rather than a liquid, and so TRW will have that contract because it will be an extension of their Minuteman contract. And uh, so aerospace will not be involved in it. And, and so that, yeah, so <laughs> I was, I, and they said, but do you have, and so they said, do you have other job offers? And I said, sure, yeah, I do. I've, you know, rejected them, but I felt confident I, you know, get them back. They said, well, let's, well before we do that, Let's see what else we can do here. And so they had, within a day, someone who was head of the fluid mechanics department called me and said, uh, how would you like to work on uh, fluid mechanics? And I said, well, uh, I've not, not really done that uh, as uh, at, here at the Rocket Lab. I, I used to do it when I was in the aero school. Uh, but uh, they said, well, uh, how about that? So <laughs> uh, I, I took the job. Uh, and went out and it changed my career. I got out of propulsion. Uh, in fact, I purged propulsion in my mind, from my mind almost, as I drove away from the rocket lab after passing my final exam uh, to, to complete the PhD, and then drove to California in 32 hours, uh, uh, the dog and I, uh, to, to uh, Charlie, to uh, to take on this other career, and uh, it was uh, it was earth-shaking career change for me, because uh, now I was uh, in the world of how to, how to re-entry vehicles carry nuclear warheads into the atmosphere, and that sort of thing, and that that became what I did uh, primarily for the bulk of my career, I worried about uh, design of. Uh, uh, nuclear delivery systems, and uh, so very different than uh, than the, the propulsion uh, career that I thought I was going right. to have. But it still prepared you. Oh yeah, it prepared me in a lot of ways. In fact, uh, we did uh, testing of uh, these nose tips, and some uh, one of the first places I went was uh, there was a guy I, I don't remember his name now from the rocket lab who had a place up in uh, upstate New York, uh, Malta, which is oh, uh, yeah. 
uh, in a, a G installation, and uh, he had a rocket engine, and that's where we tested some nose cones in his rocket engine in, in Malta, and that was one of the first things I did <laughs> when I got, uh, got out of school. And then we went to the Cornell Wave Superheater, which was in Buffalo, and uh, they did the same thing there, which was a, uh, that was a, Electronic device in uh, 50 megawatt uh, uh, source of uh, heat. Mm -hmm. What were some of the greatest challenges that you and your team during this period faced as you? Were oh, the, uh, the greatest challenges was uh, staying ahead of the Soviets. We had uh, one of our jobs was uh, we were uh, we had a Cell is not the proper choice of words, but we had we were anointed by the CIA to uh, to worry about what the Soviets are doing in this area. And so I had a group of people working for me that uh, uh, that did this, and we analyzed what they were doing. And our job was to make sure that we were ahead of them. So that was uh, it. Was we were fighting World War Three. We really, we really thought that. Mm -hmm. So it was a lot of pr emotional pressure. Oh, a lot of emotional stress. pressure, a lot of high-level reviews by uh, the Office of Secretary of Defense and that sort of people, mm -hmm. what we were doing. Mm -hmm. So my, another question we had was, what was the company culture like? Um, company culture, Aerospace Corporation was uh, uh, at that time it was called an FCRC, the Federal Contract Research Center. Uh, we provided uh, what was called systems engineering and technical direction for the Air Force. In other words, the Air Force had the, had the government responsibility of developing missiles and reentry vehicles, um, but they didn't have the, uh, the core expertise to do that. So uh, as officers they would hire Aerospace Corporation to provide the technical management skills and technical skills uh, to, to do that job because the Air Force guys would leave every three years and go somewhere else yeah. uh, and, and they would go from uh, that world into uh, fighter pilots or who knows what else. I mean, mm -hmm. they, the Air Force culture is rotated around. Uh, that's, that's the way that they do business, and so mm -hmm. the expertise was with Aerospace Corporation. So really the project management had to live yeah. with someplace stable, with people. Yeah, right. So that's, that's how we did it. So the culture was one of uh, pride in what we're doing. We, you know, we took a lot of, we were very serious about, about the job that we had, and uh, it was you know, we were about winning World War III. That's essentially it. It sounds dramatic, but that's the way we looked. Yeah. Mike, do you have any, are you thought of any, I didn't give you a chance to ask any questions that I'm. Well, the CIA direction is interesting. Did you receive the Soviet documents in translation then from translators? Uh, we did, we had our own sources. I, I, I really don't want to go into that here. Uh, but to answer your question, we did it other ways. Mm -hmm. Have you ever met Dr. Zucro when he was out in California in retirement? Did you no, see never saw him after he left here. He went from here to Santa Barbara, and I, and I was still a student, and he, he was in Santa Barbara, and uh, I never saw him. Oh, you, you were still here when he retired in 66? Yeah, yeah. I, I didn't graduate until 68. February 68, I left. What was he like as a person, as a teacher, as a I, I never had him as a teacher, so I can't answer that question. Uh, as, a, as a person, he was uh, uh, sort of walked on water type of a person. He had a, a, an image about him that was uh, uh, an aura, I guess I would say. So he was very well respected. Uh, and he was uh, not 
not, I was going to say not to be questioned, but that's kind of an unfair statement. He was, he was, he was at the top of the pack. I mean, he really, really understood the world that he was in. And so we, you know, we all listened and learned. And uh, he would, uh, he was, I think, fair with students. And uh, as far as I could tell, fair with his staff, although I was not part of the staff, so I can't really answer that question. Uh, but uh, he was uh, he was a guy who had a vision of what he wanted to do, and it's your job to make it happen. For example, uh, you know, in this uh, he had this notion that uh, we needed these high pressure tanks uh, uh, to be uh, built out here at the rocket lab uh, to house the. Uh, uh, coal gas system, nitrogen coal gas that would pressurize the fuel tanks so we could have the high pressure engines. Now we were talking about something that hadn't, hadn't really been done. These engines, uh, w we imagined the chamber pressure of the engines would be like 5,000 psi. The one I built was that. Mm -hmm. And to do that you have to have a pressure source that's uh, over 8,000 psi. So we're talking about significant tanks to, uh, to have that. So he had this notion, hey Bob, we can get some battle, you know, we, I know this guy in the Navy, and they're decom decommissioning these battleships, and they have these guns, and so we can just weld on uh, our, both ends of the gun, gun barrels, ship these, barge these things up the Mississippi, <laughs> And, and get them here and use them as tanks. So we were actively working on that. I mean, these are the types of things he would have these brainstorms. <laughs> and it was your job to fill in the fill in the blanks, make it happen. He sounds resourceful. Fortunately, fortunately, that one didn't happen. That oh. would have been a uh, a real mess. But uh, but that's that's sort of an example. Did you take other trips with him besides no, Lewis? No, uh, Lewis is the only trip I went with. He certainly traveled all over the country, yeah. um, to Washington D.C. Yeah. for NASA um, yeah. congressional hearings. Yeah. Uh, did he ever bring visitors to campus of note? Oh yeah, no, he. Uh, well, I know, uh, yeah, the, the people. Uh, that's why I say the people that funded our our research. He brought to campus, and the, these were leaders in Office of Naval Research in uh, in uh, NASA. Uh, Air Force uh, rocket propulsion lab. These were leaders uh, who we brought to campus, and uh, they would they would review what we were doing. And now it wasn't like the ONR guy just reviewed the ONR projects. Mm -hmm. ONR and AFRPL NASA would all be there, and they would review all of us. You know, we'd go. With, each guy would have maybe a half hour, forty five minutes to go through his what his research was. So that was that was really, really good. What was it like preparing? Were those the high points in terms of stress and expectation? Oh yeah, no, it was, uh, it was a lot of stress and uh, it was hard to prepare because uh, for, for one of the things was uh, preparing for briefings in those days before PowerPoint and before computers was, was arduous. It was mm -hmm. really difficult. So you're talking about poster board graphics, mm -hmm. where you had to do it all yourself, and uh, and it was it was it was not easy, and uh, and you had to have results. I mean, the, imp the graphics are assuming we have the results to begin with, but the real problem was getting the results you know, <laughs> in a way that you can demonstrate what you're doing and have it be understood by someone who's just walking in and not really exposed to what you're. So it was it was a good experience for us. You, you must have had to come back to the main campus when you had those results and needed the materials and maybe even some help. With uh, actually, we were self we were we didn't use the main campus much at all. Mm -hmm. We uh, we did, did our own thing out there. We had a machine shop and uh, uh, like like electrical electronics capability, instrumentation capability. We had very little work done, done on campus. And at that time, 
<coughs> if we had anything exotic, uh, such as uh, some exotic material, we would get a build off campus or from a vendor who was in the aerospace business. Now, these days, uh, you know, I, I've been exposed to what the Rocket Lab's doing these days. They, they do use on-campus machine shops. Today, today's world is different there than it was at that time. Uh, at that time, the Rocket Lab was self, really self and, and inclusive and did its own thing. Today, today it's, it's not. So they rely more on campus machine shops and local vendors in the Lafayette or Indianapolis area uh, to supply this or that or the other. So perhaps you were closer to the airport and the aero school than to the main campus. You had closer connections there. Did no, there was no there? connection at all with the aero school. There wasn't? Not, not, none whatsoever when I was, in, when I was at the Rocket Lab. Mm -hmm. There were two, in fact, I had to become a mechanical engineer uh, when I went into the Rocket Lab. I mean, my, my degree's in mechanical engineering. So Dr. Zucker had already moved over. Yeah, he moved over in, uh, in the late 40s. Was um, Dean Potter still around then? Yeah, Dean Potter was uh, still around. Uh, in fact, uh, we, I mentioned I was president uh, of a fraternity here, and we got him to be uh, a member of our fraternity. Oh, very good. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, he is a very interesting fellow in the chat room. How so? Well, he had a lot of what I would call old world experiences, and yes. so, and so that, that so that that was of interest to most of us. They both must have been characters on campus, Dr. Zucro and Dean Potter. Uh, Potter more so than Zucro, although uh, I'm I'm sure Zucro was, but I never saw that side of him. Well, and unfortunately, in the interest of time, um, I guess I'm going to move to my last couple of questions, if that's okay. Okay. Um, and the, and the, the second to last one is that you've had a really long, successful career. What would your advice be to engineering students today? What if there was something you could want to say? Well, I think the uh, main thing uh, that engineering students today could do is... Uh, uh, Think about uh, taking courses in uh, project management. Mm -hmm. uh, most people think, gee, that's simple, but it's not. And uh, that would be an eye opener for them. And, uh, and there needs to be a way for Purdue to bring that to the engineering curriculum, which uh, I don't think that they have. <coughs> We've done a particularly good job in doing that. Uh, most people manage projects uh, even if they're working in research uh, as opposed to managing the companies or whatever. Uh, and so it's, it's an important ability to have. And w along with that is the ability to communicate because if you cannot communicate verbally and uh, in writing and giving presentations or who knows what, uh, you're not going to make it in, in, in the engineering as a career <clears throat> because if you if you even if you be the smartest guy or gal in the world and all you can do is provide numbers uh, no one's going to understand what you're what they are unless you can explain them and <clears throat> it's amazing to me how poor uh, many engineers are at communicating oral skills speech skills writing or giving presentations, being able to describe what you're building. Mm -hmm. So that's why I, I would put a lot of emphasis on that if I were giving advice to a student. Okay. I think that's good advice. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, my last question is, is there anything that I haven't asked you that you wish that I had? Well, <laughs> no, I'm happy to answer any questions you have, but I, I, I one, I did have one of the, I mentioned at breakfast to you, one of the career changes I had for me was working in Washington yeah. mm -hmm. as a, uh, I was a congressional fellow 
At the time, I was a congressional fellow. There were uh, there were two paths that one could take. One could be a White House fellow, uh, but at the time, to be a White House fellow, you had to be 30 or under. There was a specific age limitation. Uh, to be a congressional fellow, there was really no age limitation, but although the, the inference was that you should be young. Mm -hmm. uh, I was on the older side. In fact, there were some congressmen there who were probably uh, my age. But it, that was a tremendous experience because I got to, to see how things are really done uh, in, in the Department of Defense and then NASA and other government agencies. And, how, and the, the importance of having technical uh, exposure uh, on the Hill uh, is is just uh, it's just an important element because these people are asked to make decisions, you know, senators and members of Congress and members of the House, um, multi-billion-dollar decisions with not knowing the, in their heart of hearts much about the issue at all because it's not been their training. Most of them are lawyers or business people of one one type or another. Almost none. You can count them on literally on one hand, have any technical training at all. Mm -hmm. And of those, some of them are medical doctors as opposed to engineers or scientists. And so <clears throat> it's, uh, decisions are being made by people with, without the expertise. And so, so the ability to uh, provide them help, should they choose to take it, is important. I was fortunate to work with people who wanted to help. And this was in the 1980s? Yeah, it was 1979 and 80. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was a very good experience, and I got to meet a lot of people and uh, network through the uh, community because I was, uh, the things I was working on, I worked on the SALT Treaty, and I worked on the, all the R&D initiatives at the Air Force and Army and Navy, and ARPA, or DARPA had at the time. And so I saw saw what needed to be done and all that sort of stuff. And it was it was a really a major influence on my career. And it was a, again a very stressful time. It was a stressful time, but it was it was a good time. Mm -hmm. would, would you be able ever to discuss some of that work in another interview? So sure, saw? sure. I'm any any time you want. I'm available. You know, however you choose to. You can bear this when I come up. <laughs> well, perhaps Friday we can. <laughs> yeah. you know. Was this in the late Carter years or even into the beginning of the Reagan years? Both. both. It overlapped. So you experienced both? I experienced both. And had a role in both. Well, that's that's worth another yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's a host of them in here. Uh, but I've read many of these transcripts, and this is a rich one. Appreciate all of the detail. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Thank you very, very oh, okay. much. You're welcome. Uh, Dr.